Good morning. Thank you. What an awesome song service that was. That'll lift you up if nothing else will. Would, would you like to come and join me this morning? If you would, please do so. If you want to stay in your seat, you're welcome to do that too. I found this little story this week I thought was really good. It starts with the verse, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That's Philippians 4.11. By any measure, David Ring is a successful minister of the gospel. This non-denominational evangelist has spoken in more than 6,000 churches and on national television. Every year, he receives some 400 invitations from congregations who have heard of the inspiration his messages bring. Yet this preacher says of himself, I can't even say Jesus properly. His words are slurred. He walks with a limp. When he eats, his hands shake violently. David developed cerebral palsy when his brain was cut off from oxygen for 18 minutes at birth. He grew up feeling rejected, enduring the taunts of other kids about his funny speech and funny walk. But he knew one person loved him. With one person, he could always find a place of acceptance and security. With her, his mother, he was safe. Then tragedy struck. His mother contracted cancer and died. 14-year-old David Ring wanted to die too. Life seemed too hard to endure. He was an orphan. His father had died earlier. And desperately alone in the world, but God sent a beam of grace into this sad, lonely life. One day, David went to church and discovered Jesus. Previously, he was sure God didn't love him because he'd been born with cerebral palsy. Now he learned that he was precious to Jesus just as he was. His attitude changed. His life changed. From that point, he went on to do a, se a series of impossible things finish college, get married, get married, and father children, four of them, and perhaps most remarkable of all, fulfill the divine calling to be a minister of the gospel. Look at me, he says, I have cerebral palsy. What's your problem? <laughs> he challenges people to quit whining and start sharing, to count their blessings and let the Lord lead them to new and deeper levels of service. He likes to quote Paul's words about being content. Following immediately with verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the story of David's life. As he says, every one of us limps into the kingdom, but when we get inside, we will run. Wow. What an awesome example for all of us, isn't it? Let us hold our hands and bow our heads. Our dear Father in heaven, we have so much to be thankful for. We just praise your name. You give us breath every morning, and you never leave us. You're always with us. Help us to have the attitude that David had. Help us to be close to you and close to Jesus. We praise your name, Lord. You are everything and all. And we just want to praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It is such a pleasure to be able to be here and share with my church family. I uh, The last time I was privilege to do this. Uh, the men were at a retreat, so just for their sake, I'll just tell you that I'm not a preacher. I'm an ophthalmologist. That means that I spent most of my life doctoring people's eyeballs, uh, helping people see. Every time I have a chance to do this, when I get through I want to have made much of Jesus. 
by way of introduction, before I talk about Jesus who, I need to just share a few thoughts about something that's kind of on everybody's mind these days, and that is the idea of what is your worldview. Ravi Zacharias, a well-known <clears throat> Christian apologist, has said, any worldview worth its salt must address comprehensively, hopefully, and purposefully four things. One, origin. Number two, the meaning of life. Number three, morality. And number four, destiny. As we look at things today that form people's worldview, just take a moment to think of a few. Uh, the idea, for perhaps, of biologic evolution, that is, that we're sort of super animals, the last step in the mutation toward a better life form. Uh, I think it would be pretty obvious that doesn't address those four things very well. Uh, things like naturalism and pantheism. Uh, pantheism being what is, is God. Nature and those that are in it are God. That doesn't address those four issues very completely either. What about those that are re have a religious base, such as Buddhism and Hinduism? Those have some life precepts in them that you might call an address to morality, but uh, life is not over when it's over. There, in those faith systems, when you die, how you, the, the compliance of those life precepts that are in the religious faith, uh, your ability to comply depends on what you become in the next life because they have elements of reincarnation and transmigration of the soul. And uh, I can't waste a lot of time going into some of the details of those, but I just don't see them addressing comprehensively, hopefully, and purposefully the idea of origins, the meaning of life, morality, and destiny. So I want us to look this morning, just briefly, before I get into Jesus who, the biblical worldview. Now I can make it really fast and simple by telling you that the Bible is about, uh, about God, it's about us, and about what God wants to do about us. Because we got a problem. Um, but if you begin to look at it a little more uh, closely at those four things, the issue of origin, we come from the hand of a loving creator who wanted love to operate in our relationship, so he had to give us choice. So our origin has some substance and character to it. The meaning of life, he wanted to enter into relationship with with uh, created beings who chose to be his friend and to spend eternity with him in a community of love. That's what he had in mind and that gives life real meaning. What about morality? When he gave us his law, he gave us simply ways to live that will make those relationships last and grow and be eternal. He didn't give us a bunch of things we have to do. He says if we live in a circle of relationship of love, this is how to do it so that it doesn't go wrong. When you look at most of the world views, in fact, I would say all of them, the one that comes from the Bible is the only one where your grand destiny, eternal life, is a gift. There's nothing you can do to earn it, deserve it, or accomplish it. It is a pure and simple gift. When we choose to be God's eternal friend, he says, you and I in our circle of friendship and relationship, 
you will change. And I'm telling you how to live to make that a rich and meaningful change so that we can be together forever. The best concise view of the biblical, of biblical worldview that I've come by that I could remember uh, succinctly and tightly, I discovered in the Creation Museum in Northern Kentucky. Anybody in here been there? It's worth your time. This is a museum that celebrates and supports the idea of, cre of a seven uh, day creation week. One of the little stop offs you can make as you go through there is a theater where you can go in and hear music, creation music. And I went in there and Buddy Davis was singing a song called The Seven Seas. That's not S-E-A-S, that's capital C apostrophe S. The seven seas of the biblical worldview. Those seas were as follows. Creation, where we came from. Number two, corruption, the fall. Number three, catastrophe, the flood. Number four, confusion, the difficulty in man finding a way because of selfishness and the evil one to live in a uh, situation of love with their creator. The fifth one is Christ. The sixth one is the cross. The seventh one is consummation. That is, his coming back to get us. I find that a wonderful mental little thing to use to kind of keep the biblical worldview in mind. And what you're going to discover um, as you ponder that is that Jesus is the central figure in all of it. It's all about Jesus. That's why it matters who Jesus is. Jesus has asked us a very big ask. In his word, he's asked us to put everyone in our life, I'm sorry, to put himself before everyone in our life, including ourselves and our family. He's asked us to surrender to him all that we have and are, and he will bless us. He's asked us to trust him with our grand destiny, destiny salvation. And he's asked us to do it when things in our life and in our world don't make too much sense. And there's a song that captures that notion that ask that God has made of us, that when we, in our life, in a world where we're serving a loving God, things happen that just don't seem to jive. I had that happen to me when I lost my 19-year-old son. In the song entitled, Trust His Heart, it has four lines that I want you to remember when you walk out of here. If you have things going on in your life that you don't understand. First line, when you can't understand. Second line, when you can't see his plan. Third line, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart. He's asking us to do that. That's why it matters who Jesus is. He's asking us to completely trust him. I've had a fascination and a passion for the, for the book of John for a long time. I've read it over and over, memorized large parts of it. And I find that John had a passion for who Jesus is. In fact, he was so passionately interested in sharing who Jesus is that he made it the theme of his entire book. The four Gospels, the first three were written by, the first two by Matthew and Mark. They were apostles who 
uh, wrote biography of Jesus' journey through his time on this earth. Fairly comprehensive, recording his miracles and his preaching, his witnessing, his passion, his cross, his resurrection. Matt Luke was a historian. He did it by interviewing people. But John was an apostle who didn't give us a comprehensive biography of all that Jesus, uh, of much of what Jesus did, certainly not all. But John decided that the one thing that you and I needed to know most was who is Jesus? And can we trust his heart with everything in our lives? And he gets right to the subject. In verse 1 of chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, whoever that is. And he says, The Word was with God, so the Word and the God are in community. There is a divine community here. And if you read on through the book of John, you'll discover the Holy Spirit in chapter 16 is part of that. Because God is love. 1 John 3, 4. And for love to exist, it has to be expressed, received, reciprocated, and shared. And it's done in community. So we know a couple of things already. The Word was in the beginning, and the Word was with God. There is a community. And next, the Word was God. John really wants us to know that the Word was God. In the second verse of that chapter, it says that the Word made everything that was made. Nothing that was made was, uh, was made by anybody else. It was made by the Word. So we have to identify the Word. And in ch verse 14 of chapter 1, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the Word. So we have already some amazing credentials for Jesus. He was there and he was the Word. He was with God. He was God. He was in the beginning and he made everything. That's pretty, pretty impressive credentials so far. Then he goes on down and he says, he was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. That is, he's the Savior. He's the Savior. Further on in the book of John, it says, the Father and I are the same. If you know me, you know my Father. These are amazing credentials that John lays out for Jesus. He then goes on and says, in chapter 6 of the book, that Jesus only, Peter actually makes the declaration, only has the words of life. The words of life. You see, John in chapter 1, almost exclusively, builds a CV for Jesus, his credentials. But he's not through. That's fine, but he wants us to understand somebody with those kinds of credentials is going to become one of us and live in our midst. Instead of taking lots of stories and accounts, he picks less than 10 in the book to tell us what it's like to walk and encounter the God-man, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. And he begins in chapter 3 with Nicodemus, telling him that if he wants to be his eternal friend, he needs a new heart. And that's coming from that same chapter where he declares himself to be the Son of Man. So we ought, Jesus, as he becomes flesh, becomes the Son of Man. Part of our experience to share and care with him and see if we like what we see. See if we, his heart is showing and we can trust it. In chapter 4, he encounters the woman at the well. And after telling her that if he is the living water, he tells her that if she will drink of him, she will never thirst. She gets so excited, she becomes an instant missionary and heads to town 
tells everybody, come see the man that told me everything I ever did. Chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 people because he found a boy's lunch and started handing it out, and it just kept multiplying in his hands. And when they got all done, they had to call the waitress over and get something to put the leftovers in, like we do when we have leftovers at the restaurant. He wanted them to know that he was aware of their needs and was the provider of their needs. Later in chapter 6, he walks on the, the stormy sea. And on the stormy sea, it calms. And the disciples realize that Jesus can bring peace in tumult and turmoil in your life and mine. Just awesome stories. Well, he's not through. In chapter 8, he finds the woman caught in adultery. Those who got her into the, into the act of adultery drag her to Jesus. Not empty-handed, by the way. They had stones in their hands. They plunked her down in front of Jesus and said, what should we do with her? The law says she should be stoned. Jesus doesn't answer, but writes enough in the sand to let them know he knows their secret thoughts and their secret lives. They realize that... Uh, they best exit, so they one by one begin to leave. When they're all gone, Jesus says, where are those that accuse you? She says, they're gone. He says, neither do I accuse you. And he communicates to her that not only can he read the heart, the really uh, truth of the heart, but he can forgive sin. But that's not all. He tells her, go and stop doing the things that are hurting you, and I will bless you. We know that by the end of the story that she becomes one of his ardent followers, and everyone in this day and age speaks of her because of what she did when she washed his feet. Well, that's not the end of the stories that he used to illustrate who Jesus was because the story that is the capstone before his passion, crucifixion, and resurrection is when he gets a message from Mary and Martha that Lazarus is sick. He gets that message, and he doesn't stop what he's doing. He continues to minister and work miracles for two days. Finally, he, changes, he turns to the disciples and says, let's go. They say, it's really dangerous. They're looking for you. But he says, we're going to go. So he heads there, and he's four days late, but he's right on time because of the purposes of the kingdom. Mary and Martha come to him and say, if you'd have been here, he would not have died. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he asks them to remove the stone from Lazarus' tomb. And he speaks to him and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus does come forth to new life and vitality. You see, John wanted us to know what it's like to have the word made flesh and to dwell among us and what that would be like when someone who has perfect love is in your midst, this is what it looks like. Do you like what you see? Can you read my heart in what I do? Jesus is a great promise maker. In the course of these stories, he makes some wonderful promises. And what is it you want to know about a promise maker most? If you can believe him, that's what you want to know. In fact, Jesus made a promise in John 3.16. That's probably the most famous verse in the Bible. It says, if you believe me, you won't perish. 
And then in John 14, a very famous one, I'm going to build a place for you and come and get you and take you where I am. When people make promises, you want to know if you can believe them. And John wanted to paint such a picture of the master that there would be no doubt in your mind that he can keep his word. How did Jesus show us his heart? He showed us his heart by coming to be one of us, leaving the divine community or circle of relationship to become one of us and show us what it's like for love to live in your midst. And then he says, I invite you to be my eternal friend. He showed us his heart when he became sin for us. Now, I know a lot of people may not have thought about that text too much, but Jesus didn't bring a DVD down here of all our sins and tuck it in his garment and then tuck it in what was left of his garment on the cross. That's how he bore our sin. That's not what happened. In 2 Corinthians 5, the last verse of the chapter, it says, Jesus became sin for us. He became sin. And Jesus knew full well how his father felt about sin. And he knew that when he did that, there would be a separation because he identified himself as a sinner, even though he wasn't. He died for us because he was not a sinner, but he became sin for us. He could die the sin and pay the price for sin. The wages of sin is death, and he paid that price for you and for me. He not only died for us, he rose for us. He is the resurrection and the life. And he's going to come back for us. Remember the consummation, the seventh sea? Well, Jesus says, if you choose to be my eternal friend, and if you will behold me, now I have to stop on beholding for a minute. I'm an ophthalmologist, and tongue in cheek now. The eyes are the most important, you know, they see everything. Um, the body is simply a pedestal to support the globes. How's that? (laughs) Uh, But we behold him in many more ways than just what we see. We behold him with our mind and our heart by what comes into us through our eyes and our ears and through our senses. We behold him, and then he says, follow me. He says, if you behold and follow, things in you will change. Things in you will change. But to behold and follow, we have to fall in love with the Savior. We don't have to behave perfectly and then come to him. We have, to fa- we have to fall in love with the master. And we have to be willing to trust his heart when sometimes it may not make sense. He's asking us to be his eternal friend. Asking us to let him change us into what? Into himself. What he's asking is he wants us to develop the the mind of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the priorities of Jesus, the emotions of Jesus, 
the feelings of Jesus. He says, if you'll focus and follow and don't let anything distract you from that reality, I will make myself real in you. That is an awesome thought. Lastly, he says, I'm going to make it so that you will begin to love like me. How did Jesus love? Jesus loved unconditionally even the unlovely. Even his enemies, as unthinkable as that might seem. He says, if you'll focus and follow me, I'll grow my kind of love in your heart for even the unlovely, even your enemies. Somebody sent me an email. Actually, it was Bonnie Beecraft who lives in this town and actually found the house we ended up buying here, giving me a link to a TED Talk. How many of you are familiar with TED Talks? Somebody. They're sometimes pretty good, and this one was on the topic of love. And the title of the talk and the punchline of the talk was the same. Here was the title. The greatest work of art is to love someone. Now, I would have added three words to that. I would have said, the greatest work of art is to love someone like Jesus loves. Because that's what he wants to grow in us. That we will love like he loves. And that brings up a very important text, which is frequently misunderstood. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, the last four or five verses... The last verse of that chapter says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we read that and we say, There's no way. That's hopeless. There's no way. But that's not the context of that verse. The verses that precede it read telling the reader that it is normal to love your friends. But I'm going to teach you and help you learn to love your enemies. As soon as he says that, read it for yourself. He says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. He's calling us to perfect love for others. And he says, I can grow that kind of love in you if you will focus and follow me no matter what. Martin Luther King once said, the oppressor will rarely give up his power willingly. So if you're being wronged, it isn't going to change. He says, but if you, the oppressed, forgive the oppressor, you not only affect your own salvation, but the salvation of the oppressor. Did you hear that? You see, God loves everyone, and he wants to affect the redemption of even the oppressor. And when we hate and we hold on to those feelings and we express them, and that relationship is poisoned by hatred, the redemptive energy to accomplish that is impaired, if not blocked completely. I find that an amazing thought. Somebody wrote, you need to take your hands off the throat of the oppressor so that I can redeem you both. Wow. Do you get that? He's calling on us to love the unlovely and our enemies so that his spirit can still work for the redemption of all. 
That sort of goes against our thinking. But it's what he wants to happen in our hearts. Well, I have to make this personal. This isn't just a discussion about Jesus. This is personal. And I'm going to share a little bit of my personal journey. Um, Maybe some of you can identify. But many years ago in my 50s, I'm now in my 70s, I wronged somebody I loved dearly. I uh, couldn't find peace with it. So finally, I gave in to the Holy Spirit, and I went to the individual, and I confessed my sin. And I was forgiven. And I left that feeling that now I should be at peace. But I had no peace. And you look at me, and you have a wondering look in your eye, just like I had in my mind. Why didn't I sense peace? It went on for a period of time. I thought, man, I've confessed my sin, I've asked forgiveness, and, and I don't feel a relief from the burden of guilt. Our church has a weekend retreat, and uh, my wife was out of town, so I went by myself and uh, went to the Friday night meeting and a woman by the name of Hybeth Williams, a woman pastor, a black woman pastor, a wonderful woman, I love to hear her talk. She talked that night and she talked about the stormy sea and how Jesus came into the picture and calmed the sea and there was peace. But I didn't feel peace about this situation. After that evening talk, they had an afterglow. You know how they do? You go to the cafeteria and they light candles and put them on a cross-shaped table and put chairs around it and somebody comes and sings a little bit and then they have a devotional and then you go to bed. While we were walking over there, she said to me, I was walking beside her, she said, uh, can I have your Bible? My Bible's print is too small and there's candlelight there. I need bigger print. So I handed her my Bible that she could use and we kept walking. I went over there, sat down, got a good seat toward the front and I was waiting for it to start and they began to sing. And they sang, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And in the middle of that song, all of a sudden I had this image in my mind emerge. It was an image of Jesus hanging on the cross. And not audibly like I'm talking to you, but I heard in my mind Jesus on that cross looked down at me and said, lovingly looked at me and said, Dave, it's your sin that put me on this cross and I forgive you. And I said, it's just like this relief fell over me. And I said, I can't believe it. I sense peace. The, the image faded. And uh, I went to my room, went to bed, got up at 5 o'clock the next morning, still wondering why it was before I could not have peace. And now I felt peace. The next morning, as my habit was for over 30 years while we were at that church, I climbed the mountain behind the lodge at Pine Springs Ranch, found a rock up on that mountain, sat on the rock and fell on the rock, Jesus Christ. Because it hit me what happened. What had happened is I had confessed my sin, but my pride would not let me accept the fact that my sin put him on that cross. It was somebody else's sin who was much worse. Some murderer someplace. This is personal, guys. It was my sin that put him on that cross. Well, 
My friend Robbie Zacharias said there's four things that have to be dealt with in order for sin to be evil to be dealt with, for sin not to rise a second time, and for God to be able to save people. Four things. Number one, evil had to be dealt with. Number two, justice. Number three, love. Number four, forgiveness. And he says the only place those four things were dealt with was on the cross of Jesus Christ. Evil. Hebrews 10, 14 says, because of the death of Christ, I'm sorry, 2, 14, because of the death of Jesus Christ, the devil's power was completely removed from him. He was emasculated, if you will. Justice. Jesus became sin and died the death of sin for us. Justice was satisfied. So that love, divine love, could now be unleashed and poured out on those who would choose to be his eternal friend and those who didn't, he would pour it out on them too, try to win their hearts. And because of that, he could forgive them, number four. You see, forgiveness is the final common path of love. Think about that for a minute. Well, John tells us Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And in John 15, that he wants to be our friend. What a friend to have. Well, the Gideon parable goes like this. Gideon wanted to hear God's voice. So he packs up his tent and his goods, and his camel, and he heads for the wilderness. He goes out and he pitches his tent. And then he prays to God, please speak to me in an audible voice and tell me, tell me how much you love me. There was silence, and for many days it went like that. Finally one day, just before dawn, God broke through the silence said, Gideon, wake up. I want you to know, my son, I love you. Gideon can't believe it. His heart is just thrilled, and he's in joy. And he says, man, can you just tell me that one more time? So God says, Gideon, my son, I love you. Gideon then pauses and asks God, why? Why? Do you love me? And God replies, Gideon, my son, sometimes passion is unreasonable. It makes no sense. It's who God is. He cannot help himself but passionately love you and woo and win you to his eternal friendship. All I can say is, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Oh, Heavenly Father, we're so privileged to call you our Father. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for how much he loves us and how much he wants us to choose to be his eternal friend. We pray that today we will sense his call to us and that we will renew our focus and our following so that he can become himself in us. In your name, amen.